glasses were up there. You'll also find your communion where in front of you near the songbook. Okay. Hi, Jack. Hello. Sorry, I didn't say hi properly. 732. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and death, now gone above. Alleluia, thine the glory. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia, thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God. The Spirit of Life, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Alleluia, thine the glory. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed us. Alleluia, thine the glory, Alleluia, Amen. Alleluia, thine the glory, revive us again. All glory and praise to the God of all grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Alleluia, thine the glory, Alleluia, Amen. Alleluia. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Alleluia, thine the glory. Alleluia, amen. Alleluia, thine the glory. Revive us again. 685. 685, we'll sing it through twice. 685. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence be. encouragement tonight or this evening. I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for being here tonight. If you're watching by Facebook Live, thank you for being here. And if not, then we still thank you for being here when you see it later. Turn to Daniel chapter 4, please. If I were to ask you, who is God, what would you say? Well, there are a lot of people that have different answers. Well, he's the creator. He's the king of kings. He's the sovereign. He's the ultimate. I got to thinking about this on the way on a trip this past week, that, that God is the creator of all things, and God's the destroyer of all things. Well... I hear a lot of people today tell me that we're running out of water and we're running out of air and we're running out of this and this and this. And I can't help but think to go back to, to the, the Old Testament and the principle that is established, for example, in the book of Jeremiah. God tries to get people's attention three ways. Number one, by the sword. Two, by famine. 
and three by pestilence. And the same God that created this world is going to make sure that this world will sustain long after we leave. I think it is a slap in the face to God. I think it is an utter disgrace to God to turn around and talk about how the world is just falling apart and all the things that, I mean, it, it is to a point, don't misunderstand me, but it's not falling apart to the degree that we are portrayed by the devil is the point I'm trying to make. And coming into that picture, you have Daniel chapter 4, you have the most powerful man in the world. I mean, whatever he says goes. He has been able to do something no other king has been able to do. He's been able to do something no other person has been able to do. Israel, the, the ten northern tribes, have been extinct for about a hundred years, roughly. And then you come along, and, and you have Nebuchadnezzar, who becomes king. Actually, his name is Nebuchadnezzar, but for traditional purposes, I'll leave it at Nebuchadnezzar. He comes into power at about 605 B.C., and he has he is just an ultimate his granddad trained him well he's just an ultimate warrior he is the equivalent of what we would call david in first king first kings first samuel uh and he's just whatever he says goes david had positioned the city of jerusalem in a position where it was almost impossible to be invaded but when habakkuk Tell, ask God, what are you going to do about my people who are evil? God said, I'm going to do a work in your days that even if I tell you, you will not believe it. And the king, the, the most evil empire in the world, that is Babylon, that is Nebuchadnezzar, is going to come in from the north and he's going to invade my people. He starts a siege of the city for about a year. He starts cutting off food, starts cutting off water, starts cutting off all the things that that uh, happen, and 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 he, he's slowly but surely taking control of the city. And you read an account of what happens in Isaiah 52 when he chases when they chase Zedekiah, the king, who he set up as king. And then they took his five sons, Zedekiah's five sons, and killed them in front of Zedekiah and then gouged his eyes out. That just shows you what kind of cruel people they were. And they were hated people. The only people that were more hated were the Assyrians. Uh, not even Adolf Hitler was hated as much as the Babylonians and the Assyrians. And so he's in power. He's got at least four men who are Israelites, who are the descendants of Hezekiah, fulfilling the prophecy Isaiah made that when Hezekiah showed the king of Babylon everything, that Meredith Paladin, everything was going to Babylon. And so here he is, and here is, here is Daniel, and he has excelled, just like he will later when over the 120 satraps that uh, that Daniel or that the Cyrus and and the subsequent leaders had established, especially Daniel or Darius the Mede, I keep saying Daniel, Darius the Mede, and he excelled above them all. And Daniel is the same individual that reads, that interprets the dream in Daniel two, because Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and he won't tell the magicians and the astrologers what the dream is. And, they, and he says, if you don't tell me what the dream is and its interpretation, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you and your family. And they find out that Daniel not only knows what the dream is, but he also interprets it. And it's the days of those four kings. The first one being Babylon, the second one being Greece, Persia, the third one being Greece, and the fourth one in the Roman Empire. And it's going to be a kingdom that will never ever be destroyed. That kingdom, of course, is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ that is in existence today. So everything's going well. Everything's going great. And then Daniel, or the Nebuchadnezzar, has a dream. Now he knows who to call. And you can read about the dream for time purposes. Uh, I'm not going to read the dream, but I trust you will. 
But what does the dream mean? Verse 24. I'm sorry, verse 20, uh, verse 19, I'll get it right. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation, or interpretation concern your enemies. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its abundant fruit, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. It is you, O king, who have, become, who have grown and become strong. For your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens and your dominion to the end of the earth. Inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth. Bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven. Let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my God or my Lord the king. They will drive you from men. Your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field, and they make you, and they will make you eat grass like an oxen. They will wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times will pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And as much as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that the heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. That's the interpretation of the dream. Hezekiah, or Nebuchadnezzar listens to every word Daniel says and they lived happily ever after. Why are you shaking your head at me? No. Because that's not what happened. We're not told how long it took but all of a sudden Nebuchadnezzar is walking around in verse 30 I'm sorry at the end of 12 months he's walking around the royal palace pardon me it was a year after Daniel heard this you remember everything that happens right after a year <laughs> and all of a sudden Nebuchadnezzar <coughs> says the following is this not the great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and by for the honor of my majesty. Man, it was great. Nebuchadnezzar is a, is a hero to all leaders and they lived happily ever. You already know when I say that, that's not true, is it? While the words were still in his mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, for, you, for to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and they will drive you from men, and your dwelling will be with the beasts of the field. They'll make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times will pass over you till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of time, probably seven, that seven times, 70 years, that's probably what he means, but we're not sure. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. And my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised him and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom, an excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. 
all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he's able to put down. Well, what in the world does this have to do with you and me today? What in the world can I learn from this? If Romans 15, 4 is right, there's got to be something I can learn from this. Romans 15, 4 says, These things were written aforetime, that for our learning and admonition, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Well, we've got an excellent manual here to tell us things that we could avoid, but George Zatanana's words keep coming back to me. Those who cannot remember the past, you know it, are condemned to repeat it. So let's take a few minutes here tonight to learn that we don't have the ability to choose. Whoa, 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 whoa. what? Now just a minute here. I live in the greatest country in the world. I can choose how I want to live. That's true. That is true, but we didn't have the ability to choose how to live because we are great. We, are, we were allowed the ability to choose because God gave us the ability to choose. We know Genesis 1:27. he was made, it, we were made in the image of God. He created the male and female, by the way, to these two these people who say there's no such thing as gender, I don't know what they're going to do when they stand before God. And, and God's word says male and female. There are only two sexes, as that lieutenant governor said. And you need to understand that very quickly. When people were criticizing me for saying it and you know, talking about it in class, it was President Obama who put this in. And by the way, there are some restrooms already in Silver City that say no gender. If you want to be a woman, if I want to be a woman, I can go in a women's restroom. You can't stop me. And so if, if you want to be a man, ladies, you can go in a men's restroom and nobody can stop you. I said, well, let me ask you a question. And I was talking to kids. I said, let me ask you a question. Where do Sasha and Malia go to school since President Obama is the one who put it in? They said, well, we don't know. Okay, he goes to a, they go to a private school. I understand that. I respect that. I said, now let me ask you another question. Do those kids have Secret Service protection? They never thought about it. Yes, they do. I said, so if I turned around and I started going to to the bathroom right behind Sasha or Malia and I told the Secret Service I'm a girl now I want you to raise your hand how many of you think I can get in that restroom why aren't you raising your hand because you know better the, the stupidity of going against God's word is just unreal I understand what people are saying sometimes, but I don't understand why if God said he created the male and female, and by the way, this is not going to, this is not a new thing. This is not going to last. There is a version of the Bible that takes out all genders uh, in, in it. God's an it. Jesus is an it. The Holy Spirit is an it. Let me tell you what, that's not Bible. But they've tried. Now, go to Joshua 24, verse 15. Here is Joshua, and he knows these people. Joshua's problem, the, the major problem between Joshua and Moses, was that Moses would always go to God and inquire. Joshua wouldn't. In fact, on one occasion, Joe Barnett pointed out that, that they were told by some enemies of God that they were they were really ex, you know exasperated with their lives and they they'd been this said they looked at their clothes looked at the shoes and the clothes were worn out the shoes were worn out and they made a covenant with the enemies of God and God said if you'd have just come and asked me I'd have told you no same thing happened in Joshua chapter seven you'll recall when they go to Ai they didn't go and ask God they just thought they were going to win. And Joshua's on his face, and he's complaining and whining, and God says, shut up. There's sin in the camp. Well, by Joshua 24, in what we call his valedictory address, he knows these people. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, 
Then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which are uh, the, your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And they said, oh, God forbid we serve anybody but the Lord. Joshua dies at 110 years old. The very next chapter is Judges chapter 1. What do they do? They go and do whatever they want, whatever they wish, and God sells them to the enemies. God gives them up to the enemies. But the late Mac Lyon, who was the originator of the search program, said it best. He says, the problem for Israel in that day was Judges 17.6, and Judges 21, 25 says the same thing. In those days, there was no king. That wasn't the problem. But everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That was the problem. And so our freedom is limited. Well, we, we like to think that we are a free people. I mean, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution are what's called what? The Bill of Rights. I find it amazing that our kids know the circumstances of the Bill of Rights, they just don't know the Bill of Rights. For example, can a cop walk up to you and just when and just pull you over for any reason? And they'll immediately say, no. Can a cop just walk up and just throw you in jail and throw away the key? The answer is no. Why not? I don't know. <laughs> well, the Bill of Rights says the cops can't do that. We've taken it to the extreme, unfortunately. And what we have done is that we have said that cops have no rights and the criminal has all the rights. I've never understood, nobody's ever been able to explain to me how a foreign citizen has the same rights in prison that a citizen does. If somebody can explain that to me, please, please explain that to me and, and, and make it sound just. You look in Acts 17, 22 to 31, and you're going to see that God is sovereign. We are limited in our freedom. We are limited in our freedom. Here we are. We have a pre-appointed time, a pre-appointed boundary. We have nations set in place. We have things where they're supposed to be because it is God who put it there? It is God who chooses to get involved in the affairs of the world. That's why I don't understand why the rabbi Harold Kushner, when he's trying to make sense of, of his eight-year-old son contacting leukemia and dying, says that God created the world, then he went and sat in his rocking chair. And he just put it into motion, and things just happened by chance. You read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, just those three alone, you know that's not true. And Ezekiel with it, you know that's not true. God is very involved in this creation. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we're the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness through the man whom he has ordained. He's given assurance of this by raising him from the dead. Nobody paid much attention to what Paul said until that word resurrection. The Epicureans and Stoics wanted to hear more about the resurrection of the dead, because see, it made no sense. It makes no earthly sense that someone can be resurrected from the dead. Maybe you heard about the toddler in Brazil that uh, they had uh, got him ready for burial. Of course, they don't embalm there like we do. And all of a sudden, the dad heard a sneeze and looked down, and that toddler got up. That made no sense. In fact, the kids are looking like are you sure that's a real story? Yeah, I went and verified it. It's true. That's what the people were telling Paul. There's no such thing as a resurrection. Steve Flatt said he, he uh, used to be the president of Free Hardeman University. He used to be the teacher on the Amazing Grace Bible class, preacher of the Madison Congregation in Madison, Tennessee. He said, isn't it amazing 
that we're free to choose to be right or wrong. We're free to choose our behavior, but we have no right to choose the consequences. Here's what God said in his word. This is going to happen if you do this. This is going to happen if you do that. Well, I get to choose, right? Genesis chapter 3. The very first time we ever read about the devil trying to get involved in God's affairs is in Genesis 3. And the very first thing that he does is, is he talks about the oneness. He's always going to single out something. Now, Moses writes under the direction of the Holy Spirit that they had all these trees in the garden. But there was one tree that was forbidden. And guess what tree became the most important? The forbidden. And so what does he say? Can't you eat of anything you want? Didn't God say? Watch. Didn't God say you can eat of any tree you want? Hey, God's sovereign, isn't he? God is holy. God is king of kings, lord of lords, right? Yes, except for one. We cannot eat of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. See, God put it there strategically. So people try to blame God for it. No, 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 no. You can't blame God for this one. Because what, what does he do? He keeps talking about that tree. He keeps talking about the fact that you're going to be like God. God perceives you as a threat, Satan says. I know that's not verbatim, but you're going to be like God to know right from wrong. The life part was, you shall not die. The late H.O. Matheny said, the knot in the tail. And of course, she saw it was pleasant to the eye. She saw it could make one wise. She saw it was good for food, Genesis 3, 6. John says, 1 John 2, 16, everything in the world comes into one of three categories, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And she took that forbidden fruit, and gave it to her husband, and he ate it, and for the first time, they noticed they were naked. They were naked. You see, freedom doesn't release us from the responsibility of sin. I wish it did. I wish we could tell God to a point. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to be arrogant here. But I wish we could tell God, God, uh, didn't you understand that I was ignorant and stupid? I mean, didn't you, didn't, you just, didn't you just write in your holy word that these times of ignorance God winked at, King James says, overlooked? I, I'm kind of an ignorant guy here, you know. I'm, I'm really ignorant, and, and, and parents have told me I'm ignorant, and, and people have told me. Don't you believe that? God says, no. Because we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account. I had a Christian tell me one time, that didn't apply to Christians. I went, really? Are you sure that doesn't apply to Christians? Who, to whom is the book written? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or evil. Now let me put in a caveat here. Because we're so used to talking about evil and paying for our choices. And that's true. But sometimes what we have not been very good at is when we do what God says to do. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not advocating you go home and say, and I'm the greatest Christian in the world. Because you're not. Neither am I. But what I am getting at is, we have obeyed what God said to do, and we need to rejoice in that. Not that we've earned it, not that we deserve it, no, but we need to rejoice in that. Because what did Jesus say in Matthew? What did Matthew finish up, sorry, in, uh, in Matthew 25? That's the story of he separated the goats from the sheep. 
sheep on the right, goats on the left. The sheep here, I was hungry, you gave me food. I was a stranger, you took me in, naked, you clothed me, etc., etc. The ones on the left, they hear, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was, and, and inevitably somebody will turn right around and say, well, you see what the church is supposed to do? Well, when, when as members of the church are you going to help? Oh, that's not my responsibility. You can't do that, folks. You can't say that that's not my responsibility because the church is us. The church is we. I know that's bad English. But what did Jesus say? What did the text end in Matthew 25, verse 46? These will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. And so we need to understand that there are some benefits for us. We talked about three that are that are kind of negative. Let's talk about three that are positive. Number one, my plans have limits. Oh, I, I still think about the little girl when I think about plans, and I'll just remind you of what I'm talking about. Right before she goes to bed, she's drawing a picture. And I mean, she's just getting after it. She's just going and going and going and going and going. And her dad said, it's about time for bed. She says, I just, got, I just have a little bit to do. And he said, what are you doing? She said, I'm drawing a picture of God. He said, well, honey, I don't mean to disappoint you, and I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but said, nobody knows what God looks like. She said, they will when I get through. <laughs> you see, she had a sincere heart. She's going to learn eventually that nobody has ever seen God. Jesus said that. But there are a lot of people that make plans. And have you ever made plans that never turned out the way they were supposed to be according to yourself? Oh, I look back and think about the plans that I had. Oh, my goodness. I thought God was cruel and mean because he wouldn't let me have a preaching job at 12 years old. Mercy. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. Proverbs 19, 21, There are many plans in a man's heart, Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. You think back in history of all these leaders that planned out things. Did it go according to what they wanted? About 99% of the time, no. For example, did Adolf Hitler become the leader of the world? No. Did Napoleon become the leader of the world? No. And there are people who claim today that there is a new world order being established in which the elite will control everything. Well, I'm not saying there's no plans for it, but folks, that's been in the plans according to them since former President George H.W. Bush said in his acceptance speech of the Republican nomination in 19... 1988 a new world order and everybody picked up on that and put that in and folks they have plans but none of those plans have come to fruition the book of revelation talked about one government who had all these plans they owned 85% of the world and Great Britain inherited it. Now let me ask you a question. Does the Holy Roman Empire exist today? The answer is no. Does the British Empire exist today? No. I don't know how long this country will last. But if I studied history and I understand it right, this country is not going to last forever. I wished it would. I wish it would go back to the way things were when it first started, when people thought about each other and people weren't selfish and pig-headed. But nonetheless, the Lord's counsel is going to prevail. And this is so classic. James 4, 13 to 16, you know it. Come now, you, who, you rich who say you're going to go to such and such a city, spend a year, buy and sell there, when you don't know what's going to happen. 
you don't know what your life is like. It's like a vapor that appears for a while and vanishes away. What you should say is if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. Now, notice what verse 16 says, and sometimes I leave it out unintentionally, but I do. All such boasting is evil. Not bad, evil. Because, see, what we do, unfortunately, is we think problems are God's way of punishing us. We think problems are God's way of punishing us. We, we get it in our minds. I don't know if it's from Satan. It ultimately is, I know. But we get it in our minds somewhere along the lines. If things are going great, then God loves me. If things aren't going great, God hates me. Wait a minute. God loves. God may regard less Someone that's not his child. But God doesn't hate like we do. He loves. And so sometimes what we miss is Genesis 50, verse 20. I admire a lot of Bible characters, and this is one of my top five, and that's Joseph. Jacob is dead. The sons, Joseph, they think Joseph's going to take revenge because you'll recall... They took and left him in a pit to die. They hated him with a passion because Jacob made the mistake of favoring his child, Joseph, because he was of his favorite wife, Rachel. And so here he is, and they think that he's going to kill him, and they make up this story that Jacob said, you're to keep us alive. Joseph says, am I God? What you meant to happen was for evil. But God meant it for good to save many people as it is this day. If, the, if Genesis had ended right there, man, we'd be all elated. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be disrespectful of the book. But notice how the book ends. Joseph leaves instructions that he's going to die, that they're going to leave Egypt, and that the first thing they're to do is bury my bones in the promised land. Can you imagine having Joseph's bones for 40 plus years? 40 plus years. Because it took 40 years for that first generation to die off. Only two that left Egypt went to the promised land, Joshua and Caleb. And the first thing Joshua does is he buries those bones. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, we, we use this in the context of, of stuff that, that uh, we fall into, and that's what James says. And that word consider or count in James 1, 2 to 4 is an accounting term. It means it's a credit when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. That is what we need. I don't know how many brethren I've heard pray, Father, give me patience. And I just look and go, are you sure you're ready to handle that? And I'll walk to, to them in Christian love and say, are you sure you're ready to handle that? Because the one thing I've learned is the only way you get perseverance is resistance. You endure the resistance. And by the way, I know Dr. Charles Beeson's right. Exercise is a vulgar word. He was a cardiologist. But do you know every guru expert will tell you that if you want to be in greater shape, Resistance is the key. I hated saying that, by the way. I hope you know that. Because what I want is I want to go with the flow. I warned my dad and my mom when we went to the catwalk years ago. It will be easier going up than it will coming down. And they said, why? Because gravity is great until you need to get up. 
And sure enough, it took about a quarter mile for him to figure out what I was saying. Same thing here. The trials of our life, and we got at least one, I don't know about you, but I got at least one, produce perseverance. And Peter said, look, I want you to know that you're grieved by these various trials, but they're only temporary. Because these trials do to us what a fire does to gold. It refines it. And then he puts the icing on the cake. And that is that when we get to the end of our faith, that faith being refined through trials and tribulations, we receive the salvation of our souls. We receive the salvation of our souls. You go back in history and you read, and you will find the people who, as Patrick was joking with me about earlier, who want it easy, are not the people who are going to have are going to inherit eternal life. Why? Because Romans eight twenty eight comes to comes to mind. And Romans eight twenty eight is one of those passages that's been abused, manipulated, twisted. And what Romans 8, 28, they, people have told me, says is, well, you know God's going to work everything out for everybody. Is that what it says? No. We know that God will what? God will make everything right. But he will do it to those who love him and are called according to to his purpose. Now the question comes up, how does that work? And I got I got an answer for you. I don't know. That's why he's God and I'm not. And so, oh, did you have to talk about this one? Because see, I just don't think prayer works. I've heard members of the church say it. I believed it one time. Because you see, I prayed and 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 I prayed, and I know you have too, about one subject in particular. Maybe you've prayed more, but at least one. And you've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and it doesn't change. I want you to look at 1 Kings 20 with me. One of my favorite Bible characters is Hezekiah. He tells the people, you don't listen to the Assyrians. You don't listen to Sennacherib. You don't listen to anybody. When God said he will never step foot in this city, you listen to God. And Rob Shekha walks up there and he tells them, don't believe anything Hezekiah tells you because what God is there that I've never defeated? <laughs> Let me tell you, Sennacherib, you haven't defeated the real God. And Jesus Christ went in the midst of that camp and destroyed 185 Assyrian soldiers, 185,000, I'm sorry, Assyrian soldiers in one night. Where did you find Jesus Christ in that? You're not going to find the word Jesus Christ. But you are going to find the word angel. And you're going to find it capitalized. And there's only one set of members that get capitalized, and that's deity. And so here he's doing great. He has stood for God. And God says to Isaiah, tell Hezekiah, get your house in order, you're going to die. It was a shock. It was, it was a total shock to Hezekiah. But well, what did God say? If you get arrogant, I'm going to call you on the carpet for it. And that's exactly what Hezekiah did. And he prayed. And God says to Isaiah, go back to him and tell him I've extended your life 15 years. Put figs on and uh, put a poultice on the, the boil, and he was made well. But God humbled him. Look at his own son. Now, if you think prayer doesn't work, 2 Chronicles 33 talks about his son Manasseh. He is horrible. In fact, Ahab is a baby compared to Manasseh. 
The Bible says Manasseh provoked the Lord more than any king. And when God took away his kingdom, Manasseh prayed and repented. Now, we don't have the prayer in Scripture, but it's in the Apocrypha if you want to look. And whether or not all those words are accurate, that's not the point. The point is, when he prayed, God restored his kingdom. God restored his kingdom. Now, wait just a minute. You're telling me the most evil king that ever existed up until Manasseh's day. You're telling me that he provoked the Lord more and he was restored? Yes. Look at James 5.16. Oh, this really isn't that important, is it, Dwayne? Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Bree and I laugh about us. I especially laugh about this because not that I'm making fun of the scripture. But I think Jason Derulo, no, I'm sorry, Jason and the long road, Jaron and the long road, the long road to love, put it what, what a lot of people would like to say. He starts off the song, I haven't been to church since I don't remember when. Things were growing great, and then they fell apart again. So I listened to the preacher, and I heard, told him, and I did what he told me to do. You can't go hating others when they've done wrong to you. Sometimes we get angry, but we must not condemn. Just do your best and pray for them. I pray your brakes go out, going downhill. I pray your flower pot falls from the windowsill and knocks you in the head like I'd like to. And you can keep going with the song. <clears throat> pray for one another. Don't pray for their bad. Pray for their good, that you may be healed. You see, James says this isn't just the person that, that has done wrong. This is for our benefit as well. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. I want to correct something I said a while back, and I didn't intend to get it wrong. But go to Revelation chapter 8. I said a while back that Revelation 7 was where this was, and I want to correct that, and I apologize to you all. But the first time I saw this, it just blew my mind away. I grew up believing, and I grew up thinking, that heaven is this place where it's tranquil, peaceful, non-chaotic no noise I mean I, I, it's just perfect it is perfect but when you read the book of Revelation you don't read heaven being a tranquil place you don't read any of that you read it is just chaotic and by the way that's only what John was permitted to see and look what happens in chapter 8. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. Now, if there was silence for about a half hour, I don't know why a half hour, but that's what he says, then it must have been noisy and chaotic. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to, give, to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it, with what stood heaven still for 30 minutes? Singing? No. Preaching? Oh, no. Giving? No. Partaking of the Lord's Supper? No. Praying. He should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was, before, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. 
Now, how about that for prayer? How about that for prayer? You see, you and I don't think prayer is that important. Oh, don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to say that prayer is not important. What I am getting at is the fact that, hey, wait a minute. I'm talking to air, aren't I? God doesn't listen to me. We have a very popular Mexican food restaurant in our area. And, and I've tried to talk to the owner about doing something about the noise on the north side. Very good place to eat. I highly recommend it. But we went in there one night, and ever since then, if they put us in that room, I warn my family, I'm not going to say much. And the reason is, is because the noise in there is so loud. One night we went in there, and Brienne kept trying to talk to me about something, and, and I just I couldn't hear her. I've gotten to that point where I can't hear very well uh, things if there's a lot of background noise. I used to wonder why in the world my roommate would say, can you hear that television? All I hear is music. I can hear both. If I can't now. And all of a sudden, it just got louder and louder and louder and louder. And my family would say something to me, and I'd go, you think that's the way God works with prayer? All these people talking to him at the same time, and God doesn't say, you know, I get so tired of hearing from you. I get so tired of hearing your voice. Do you ever shut up? My aunt said it best when she said, Dwayne, we prayed to the good Lord you talked to. You turned four years old, and we prayed ever since you just shut up. Do you ever shut up? I never have read. I've never heard. I've never had God tell me. Do you ever shut up? I've heard God say, I want to hear from you. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear you. Last night, my mother called when I was driving, so I couldn't talk on the phone. But guess who called this morning? Guess who called because my son didn't tell me that my mother called? Oh, you're in trouble with Grandma. Well, not much. Grandma can let grandkids get away with murder. He said, she said, he was supposed to tell you. See, my mother wants to hear my voice. I want to hear her voice. She always tells me when I say, well, how you doing? She says, well, I'm here. And she usually hears me say, I'm glad. I'm glad. Sounds strange, doesn't it? That's what God says. I'm glad you're part of my family. I'm glad you're mine. I love you so, so much. That's why this song means so much to me. If you'll take your song books, turn to 910. 910. First John 4, 7, and 8 says that's his name, love. Agapeo, love. The love that says, I'll think of you before I think of me, the highest form of love. And if you need his love tonight, we would love to serve or help you with that as we sing. Boundless love, unending joy, this is my life, it's what I know. I can't believe that he selected me, Jesus my Lord, it's you I own. Boundless grace, because of Calvary, his life he gave, his love outpoured. I am can live with him eternally. Jesus, my Lord, it's you I owe. 621. We're going to do what Dubs taught us to do. We're going to sing the chorus at the very last. 621. Give those who were unable to take the Lord's Supper this morning an opportunity to do so. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior, so pure and free from sin. 
They said, crucify him, he's to blame. Upon his precious head, they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the King. They struck him and they cursed him and mocked his holy name. All alone he suffered everything. When they nailed him to the cross, his mother stood nearby. He said, Woman, behold thy son. He cried, I thirst for water, but they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful work of man was done. To the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone, and when he cried, it's finished. He gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone. We thank you that the plan of salvation had to be fulfilled. All righteousness had to be fulfilled. But Father, we sure could understand and we could never have blamed him or you if he had. Father, we thank you that he went to that cross determined and he went to that cross fully, fully aware of what was about to happen. And he did it because he loves us. He did it for us. Father, we go back to that night when Jesus took that bread, gave thanks, and he said, This take, eat, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. It's in Jesus we pray. Father, our minds continue in that thought. That Jesus said that this drink from it, all of you, the cup, for this is my blood of the New Testament shed for the forgiveness of sins. Father, Jesus told us also if we don't eat his flesh and drink his blood, we have no part of him. We thank you for the emblems that we have that are a part of that. The unleavened bread which represents his body, the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. And may, Father, we continue to cherish, to re-cherish, and to re-appreciate how fortunate we are that someone paid our debt, and now our sin is all gone. It's in Jesus we pray. Eight hundred seventy four. Eight hundred seventy four, and I'm going to ask Patrick to dismiss us in prayer as soon as we are through with this song. Eight hundred seventy four. Thank you for being here tonight. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. How He loves me. How I love. He still loves me, me the 
So much easier it would be with you at our side. Father, we need your help. We need you to remind us. Father, so many things, so many things. So many things the devil comes in and tries to coerce us or fool us. Through greed, through lust, through fear, through anger, all those things, Father. Help us to turn to you, Father. For those things are meaningless when we think of where we're going to be because of your grace, because of your patience, Father. Without that, Father, we deserve to go to be with the devil. Father, so many, so many things that we don't need to 